We'll take a look now at the vasculature of the upper limb. Now, all this gets a little complicated, so this part might be worth watching a couple of times. There are three branches that come off the aortic arch. Two of them, shown here, are the subclavian arteries. Now, a clinical point regarding the subclavian arteries is that they travel deep to the anterior scalene muscles, but superficial to the middle scalenes, which is also true for the course that's taken by the major veins and nerves in this region. These larger vessels here are the common carotid arteries. This first small branch is the vertebral artery, which runs through the transverse foramen of the cervical vertebrae up to the head. And the second branch is the thyrocervical trunk. Now all three of these typically show up medial to the anterior scalene muscle shown earlier. Branching off of the thyrocervical trunk is the transverse cervical artery, which courses along the medial border of the scapula. Once the subclavian passes the first rib, it's then known as the axillary artery, which is itself divided into three parts. The first part runs from the lateral border of the first rib to the medial border of the pectoralis minor, one of the small muscles in the chest. One main branch arises from this portion, and that branch is the superior thoracic artery. The second part of the axillary artery is the portion that lies deep to the pectoralis minor, or underneath the pectoralis minor. There are two branches found in this section. The first branch is the thoracoacromial artery, and the second is the lateral thoracic, shown here. The third and last portion of the axillary artery is the portion that is lateral to the pectoralis minor. Technically, there are three branches that extend from this segment. You have the anterior and the posterior humeral circumflex arteries, but these actually connect with each other and wrap around the neck of the humerus. And then you have the subscapular artery shown here. The axillary artery then turns into the brachial artery once you pass the axilla or the armpit. The brachial artery courses along the medial side of the arm until it reaches the cubital space where it then splits, giving off the radial artery, which travels along the radius, and the ulnar artery, which of course travels along the ulna. The venous system is named much the same as the arterial system and travels much the same course as well. Here we see the subclavian veins. Again, these will pass between the anterior and middle scalene muscles. The subclavian then turns into the axillary vein and gives off the first major branch, which is called the cephalic vein. This is the big vein that runs along your bicep. The axillary then turns into the brachial vein and gives off another branch called the basilic vein, which is that big vein that runs more on your tricep. Now the brachial vein will run deeper than the cephalic and basilic veins. Again, around the cubital space, there's a good deal of branching that occurs, and one prominent branch is the median cubital vein that connects the basilic and cephalic veins. The brachial vein, again, is running deep to all of these and gives off the radial and ulnar veins shown here in the forearm, whereas the cephalic and basilic veins continue on their course running through the forearm as well. Now the difficult thing is that all these arteries and veins run together and in a real cadaver or real living body they aren't conveniently color coordinated as red and blue so it's a little bit harder to distinguish once you get inside a body but a good way to do that is to remember that your arteries are generally deeper and they're also much thicker than your veins. Your veins, you're going to be able to see the blood in them, and uh, they're pretty thin and flimsy. So once you get to that point, that's a good way to distinguish between the two. The last thing we really want to take a look at is the nerve supply to the upper limb. Specifically, we want to look at the brachial plexus. Now, brachial means that it pertains to the arm, and plexus just means that it's kind of a net-like structure that the nerves branch and then rejoin together over and over again. 
The brachial plexus begins just off the lower cervical and upper thoracic vertebrae. It then travels between the anterior and the middle scalenes, just like the blood supply does, and then it extends into the upper limb, giving off a ton of branches along the way. Here, we're just going to break down the brachial plexus itself and name the branches, but we're not going to follow those branches to their termination points. The plexus is divided into four sections, the roots, the trunks, the divisions, and the cords. A good way to remember this is the mnemonic, really tired, drink caffeine. And that gives you roots, trunks, divisions, cords. The roots come from the anterior rami of spinal nerves C5, 6, 7, and 8, as well as T1. And as they emerge from the vertebral column, they merge together to form the trunks. And there are three trunks, the superior trunk, the middle, and the inferior trunk. Each of the trunks then will split into two divisions. They'll give rise to an anterior division and a posterior division. So you end up having three anterior divisions and three posterior divisions. Now most of the time, a helpful guide for determining which are the anterior divisions and which are the posterior divisions is to notice here that all three of the posterior divisions end up merging together whereas only two of the anterior divisions merge together. After the divisions merge, we end up with the lateral, medial, and posterior cords. The posterior cord is pretty easy to identify. It's the cord that comes after all three of the posterior divisions merge together. The other two are a little bit more difficult to remember. The lateral cord comes from the anterior divisions of the superior and middle trunks, while the medial cord comes from the anterior division of the inferior trunk. Now here you may just want to take a minute and stop and review these main sections of the brachial plexus because next we're going to go through and show all the branches that come off the plexus. And that gets a lot more complicated and a lot more confusing and hard to remember. So just take a minute and review these so that you have a good solid foundation to build off of. I'll try to show all these branches of the brachial plexus in some kind of orderly fashion. I'm going to work through all the branches of the lateral cord first, and then we'll go down the medial cord branches, and then finally the branches of the posterior cord. First, I want to point out this sort of obscure branch. This one up here, this long thoracic nerve, is different because it's the only branch that originates from the roots of the plexus. And it comes off a few of the roots, and they merge together, and the nerve travels down the thoracic cavity. Now, off the lateral cord, the first nerve that we come to is the suprascapular nerve. The next one that we come to is this one, the lateral pectoral nerve. The lateral cord then splits into two portions. One portion goes on by itself, and that's the musculocutaneous nerve. The other portion merges with a portion of the medial cord to form the median nerve. Just like the lateral cord splits, the medial cord does the same thing. Again, part of it merges to form that median nerve. The other part forms the ulnar nerve, which is the nerve that you hit when you hit your funny bone. It travels down across your elbow, and when you hit it, you get a funny feeling, and that's why it's called your funny bone, but it is in fact because you hit your nerve. Now working back up the medial cord, we have the medial antebrachial cutaneous nerve, and then the medial brachial cutaneous nerve, and this last branch up here closer to the divisions is the medial pectoral nerve. Now notice something that might help is that all these little branches start with medial something and they all come off the medial cord so that might be a helpful way to remember their names. Now for the branches off of the posterior cord, the main branch that the posterior cord basically turns into is this radial nerve and then moving up it we have the axillary nerve that supplies the deltoid. And then here we have the lower 
and upper subscapular nerves on either side of the thoracodorsal nerve. Now a good way to remember these three is that they'll branch off around the same location. And so you can remember that the third one down or the most distal one will be your lower subscapular nerve. The most proximal one will be your upper subscapular nerve. And the one between those two will be your thoracodorsal nerve. Now that's a lot to take in. It's a lot to remember. And to be honest, none of it's really easy to memorize. But it's important that you do so because nerves are vital to how our bodies function. They provide us with sensation. They provide us with the ability to move our muscles, to control our organs. And if you're going into the medical profession, any medical profession, you need to know all those things. Or even in this situation where you just might need to identify them, or you may be dissecting them out of a cadaver, you need to be able to find and correctly identify a nerve, be able to determine its pathway through the body, and what structures it ultimately innervates. 